Hello, everyone. Thank you all for coming today, um, tonight. Um, I'm Karen, and I'm the president of the Young Americans for Freedom here at the University of Washington. Um, uh, before we begin, I would like to give, um, acknowledge the people who made tonight possible. Um, first, I would like to thank um, Renee and Emily, who's our advisors here at the Student Activities Office for um, guiding us and helping us through this entire process. Um, next, I'd like to give a big, big thank you to the Young America, America's Foundation for sponsoring this entire event. Um, this wouldn't have been made possible without Pat and um, the foundation support. Uh, lastly, I would like to thank my officers and friends here up in the front um, for really putting this whole entire thing together. Um, I wouldn't have asked a better team. Um, this, this entire event was truly based off of teamwork. Um, and uh, I'm going to introduce um, Jack Pickett, who will be introducing Dinesh himself. All right, well, thank you all for being here. Like Karen just said, my name is Jack Pickett. I'm the co-chairman of the Young Americans for Freedom chapter here at the University of Washington. Uh, I know you just heard her thank a lot of people, and I also just wanna echo uh, those thanks. We couldn't have done it without the help of so many amazing uh, individuals and organizations and teams that really helped collaborate to make this uh, really special, unique night happen. Um, but those thanks are incomplete. Uh, without thanking our fearless leader who pulled the oar harder than anyone else, who spent more hours and uh, shed more tears and sweat uh, more than any other officer, and that's our chairman, Karen Huang. Um, she really deserves a huge round of applause, so please just join me in thanking her. Uh, and I have the distinct honor of introducing someone who needs very little introduction. Uh, he has written numerous books and produced several films. I hope you've read and seen them all. I am a big fan of his. He is a courageous conservative who constantly fights uh, for what is right and for what is true in a way that is dignified and civil and rep represents everything that we here at YAF at UW are about. Uh, so I'm not going to talk anymore. I'm going to let him talk because that's what you're here for. So please join me in welcoming the one and only Dinesh D'Souza. Thank you so much. This is great. Um, I'm very excited to be here. I'm here with my wife, Debbie. And um, well, what a time to be speaking on a college campus. Because um, ever since Trump's election, now 10 months ago, the whole political climate in America has been completely roiled. It's been churned up. Uh, and um, suddenly we realize that we're, we're in a kind of a surreal moment um, on, on all sides. And um, accusations are flying from all directions. I want to focus on two topics that I think are at the heart of the current debate. The first is the topic of fascism. And the second is the topic of white supremacy, white supremacy. Um, the topic of white supremacy is an escalation of a topic that's been in American politics now for a long time, the topic of racism. But the topic of racism began, at least in, in, in my lifetime, um, initially more moderately with the issue of prejudice. People were thought to be prejudiced, and prejudices could be cured by education. And so we've gone from prejudice to racism, and then institutional racism, and now 
the master charge, <coughs> white supremacy. And that's what's been going on with the toppling of the Confederate monuments, um, and also with the, the NFL controversy, the whole notion that white supremacy is not only at the heart of America, uh, not only at the heart of the South, <coughs> but <coughs> it's at the heart of Trump. It's at the heart of the Republicans. And so the white supremacy charge has contained within it this idea that racism is a phenomenon of the right. I'll come back to that. Now, since Trump, we've had the added accusation of fascism. Trump's a fascist. Uh, the GOP, the Republicans, are the party of, of neo-Nazism. And again, behind this idea is, is a big claim. I will show tonight it's a big lie that fascism is a phenomenon of the right. Now, this idea that fascism is on the right is not a phenomenon of the Trump era. In fact, it's been with us for almost 75 years. It's encoded in our textbooks. It's in every media account. If you Google fascism and look it up on Wikipedia, it'll say fascism is right wing. And what I'm maintaining is that all those people who say that are either wrong or lying. And uh, <clears throat> that this is a big lie, in other words, that got started right after World War II. And the people who started it knew it was a lie. Uh, they were up to something that I will describe in, in a minute. Let's start with the fascism issue, and then I'm gonna talk about white supremacy a little bit later. So, Trump is said to be a fascist because, well, because he's a nationalist. Trump wants to make America great again. Didn't Hitler want to make Germany great again? The only problem with this kind of facile equation of nationalism with fascism is that nationalism is present all across the political spectrum. Gandhi in India was a nationalist. So was uh, Mandela in South Africa. Fidel Castro was a nationalist, so was Che Guevara. All the anti-colonial leaders were nationalists, as was Abraham Lincoln. Winston Churchill, de Gaulle, the American founders. So unless you're willing to, to, to insist that all these people were fascists, which is absurd, you have to admit that nationalism doesn't quite get us there. Uh, Trump is a fascist because um, <clears throat> he's a racist. And here's where fascism and racism sort of intersect. That, that Trump has been, he's against the Mexicans, and he's, he's against the Muslims. Now, even if that were true, let's say that Trump believed that every Muslim is a terrorist, and every Mexican is an illegal. He doesn't believe those things, but let's say he did. He still wouldn't be doing it on behalf of white supremacy. In other words, Trump's point is that the Muslims are a threat to America and that illegal immigration is a threat to America. In other words, Trump isn't defending white nationalism, he's defending an American nationalism. And whether he's right or wrong to do that, there's nothing racist about that. Remember that most immigrants who come to America now are non-white. They come from Asia, from Africa, from South America. Uh, have you ever heard Trump say, you know, I think we should only take immigrants from Australia, Canada, and Iceland. No immigrants from Barbados or Bombay. This is dumb. Trump has never even implied this. So, there's the, so Trump isn't drawing a racial line at all. And the problem with this kind of whole big dance about fascism is that it takes away from what fascism really is and what fascism really means. So the term fascism comes from the fasci, which is a bundle of sticks tied together. And in that image, you get a clue to the meaning of fascism. The meaning of fascism is collectivism. We're all in it together. Now, all the founders of fascism in every European country 
were men of the left. To take the, the example of France, Jean Aleman, the founder of French fascism, was a long, lifelong socialist, very involved in the Dreyfus case in the late 19th century. Jacques Doriot, the second man of French fascism, was a communist. He made the simple jump from communism to fascism. <clears throat> and so it goes, down the list. In Italy, Mussolini, the founder of fascism, in fact, Mussolini creates the first fascist regime in the world, Mussolini was one of the most famous Marxists in Italy, along with Gramsci. When Mussolini founded the fascist party, he got a letter of a telegram of congratulations from Lenin. And Lenin basically says to Mussolini, congratulations to a fellow revolutionary of the left. Lenin recognized that. Mussolini was the editor of the Socialist Party newspaper called Avanti. And all the Italian fascists were leftists, without exception. In Germany, Hitler comes to the German Workers' Party, a, a labor union in effect, and when he takes it over, he renames it. He adds the words National Socialist. So the German Workers' Party becomes the National Socialist German Workers' Party. <clears throat> now, a lot of people on social media these days think that the Nazi invocation of the word socialist was some sort of a, a joke, that the Nazis were sort of kidding about that. But all you have to do is listen to them. I mean, Goebbels, Hitler's top deputy, later propaganda minister, Goebbels goes, we are national socialists, but notice that national is the adjective and socialist is the noun. In other words, Goebbels is saying our nationalism is important, but our socialism is central. The Nazi party published a 25-point platform available online, and if you look at it, just read it. Confiscatory taxation, confiscation of war profits, uh, the shutting down of industries, nationalization, government control of all major and essential industries, uh, increased pensions, increased health care, lifelong welfare state expansions. You go on and on. There are a couple of alien words in there, usury, referring to interest. The Jews, who are sometimes described in, in language like greedy swindlers, things like that. But if you just cross out the word Jews and you write in, for example, Wall Street, and you just cross out the word usury and write in its meaning, the word interest. And then you took that Nazi 25 pl point platform and read it at the Democratic National Convention. <laughs> <laughs> you would have chance of, of <clears throat> people would think it had been drafted by Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth <laughs> Warren. Now, <clears throat> so the point I'm making here is that Sorry. It's a call, but I don't have to take it. <laughs> um, so this was, this is the origin of, this is the origin of fascism on the left. Now, interestingly, the fascists are seen on the right today because of World War II. Right, in World War II you had the Nazis on one side, you had the Soviet communists on the other, and people go, well, the Soviet communists were obviously on the left, so the Nazis must be on the right. But this doesn't actually make sense because the only difference between national socialism and communism is that one is a socialism circumscribed by national borders, and the other is international socialism. In fact, Nazism and communism are cousins. They're sort of like the Shia and the Sunni. And that's actually a very good analogy because here's a perfect example of sister ideologies, the Shia and the Sunni, who are fighting about very little. They agree on 95%. But they're fighting about some fine points of doctrine and about competition for followers and territory and power. But they've been fighting for centuries. So sometimes it is the case, as with the Catholics and the Protestants, the Shia and the Sunni, that ideologies closely aligned can nevertheless have bitter conflict. 
So this explains how it is possible in World War II for Nazism and Soviet communism to be enemies. People say things like, well, well, didn't Hitler kill all the socialists in Germany? First of all, he did not. Hitler did fight the communists, but his objection to the communists was not that they were left wing, was not that they were socialists. It was very simply that they were taking their orders from Moscow. It was the, the so they violated the national aspect of national socialism. That was what the fight was all about. Now, interestingly, this positioning of fascism on the left was completely known in America. And in fact, American progressives saw the fascists as their allies, in fact, as their friends. Uh, Mussolini uh, was a big hero to progressives in America for 20 years, starting in the 20s and continuing to the, in the 30s, pretty much all the way to the outbreak of World War II. FDR adored Mussolini. He sent members of his New Deal to fascist Rome to study the New Deal because he wanted to, he saw it as more progressive. He, he saw Italian fascism as more progressive than the New Deal. And he wanted to bring those ideas to America. Mussolini, for his part, reciprocated. He reviews FDR's book called Looking Forward in an Italian newspaper. And he basically goes, great book, great guy. He's one of us. He's a fascist. So this kind of mutual admiration society was going on between, between the New Deal and, and the fascists. I think looking back on the 20th century, we'd have to say that the 20th century gave birth to three sister ideologies quite closely aligned. Socialism slash communism, fascism, and progressivism. And all of them recognized a kind of ideological kinship with each other. In my book, The Big Lie, I outline three major ideas, three major policies that the Nazis got from American progressives or from the Democratic Party. I'm not talking about analogies between what they did and what was done in America. I'm talking about ideas that the Nazis literally lifted from the Democrats. And this is not a matter of conjecture or speculation because in recent decades, a lot of information has become available. And so, for example, James Whitman, a scholar at Yale Law School, recently discovered that the Nazis who wrote the Nuremberg Laws, these are the laws that made Jews into second-class citizens, uh, those Nazis uh, gathered together in a room, and they had a stenographer present, and one of them basically said, hey, we're starting the world's first racist state. This is fantastic. We've got to make a record of it. It's historic. And one of the Nazis kind of raised his hand sheepishly, and he goes, well, we can't really do that, because the Democratic Party in America has already done it. And the Nazis are like, what? They're shocked. And this guy, who actually studied in Arkansas, says, no, we want to outlaw intermarriage between Germans and Jews. The Democrats already do that. We want to have state-sponsored segregation against the Jews, put them into ghettos. The Democrats already have that. We want to confiscate Jewish property and have racial terrorism against the Jews, pogroms and so on. The Democrats already have the Ku Klux Klan. They've, got, they've beaten us to the punch. And the Nazis were super impressed. <clears throat> the, <laughs> the, the next time they got together, they literally had in their <coughs> They literally had in their hands the democratic Jim Crow laws. Now, you might, you might pause and say, wait a minute, Dinesh. What's this about democratic Jim Crow laws? Aren't these the Jim Crow laws of the South? Very important to realize every Southern segregation law, without exception, was passed by a democratic legislature signed by a democratic governor. There are no qualifications or exceptions to this rule. This has been sort of camouflage in the textbooks but this was Democratic Party policy through and through. Promoted by the Southern Democrats, supported by the Northern Democrats. Okay, so in the course, I just want to finish up on this Nazi meeting. In the course of the meeting, one of the Nazis raised a very interesting question. He goes, one of the problems we're having is we can't define who is a Jew. In other words, 
there's been a lot of intermarriage in Germany over the centuries. How do you actually classify a Jew? And the Nazi who had been to America goes, again, we can turn to the Democrats. They figured it out. They've got this thing called the one drop rule. And the Nazis were like, the one drop rule? And, and as this guy, a guy named Krieger explains, he goes, yeah, basically for the Democrats, if you have one drop of black blood, if you have a single black ancestor, you're black. And the Nazis look at each other and they go, that's too racist even for us. <laughs> they go, well, we, we can't go that far. And, and in reality, the Nuremberg Laws, if you read them, do not. The Nuremberg Laws actually draw a kind of line in which you have to have three Jewish grandparents, and there's a set of other criteria, but the Nazis did not decide to go as far as their democratic American counterparts. Now, this kind of traffic between the Hitler and the, and, and the American progressives and Democrats would simply not have been possible if the Nazis were somehow right wing. And all the stuff that we hear about, oh, but the, the conservatives in Germany supported Hitler. All of this relies on a sleight of hand that uses a completely different meaning for the term conservative than we would recognize in America today. See, this whole business of the right and the left goes back to the French Revolution. And in the French Revolution, the defenders of the revolution sat on the left. These were the champions, these were the philosophes, the defenders of the French Revolution, and the opponents of the revolution sat on the right. Who were those guys? They were basically defenders of throne and altar. They were defenders of the Ancien Regime before the French Revolution. So these are said to be conservatives. But of course, this conservatism, which is a defense of, of, of throne and altar in alliance, a defense of aristocracy and monarchy, this is not what we understand as conservatism in America today. This is not the conservatism of free markets. The Nazis, the conservatives who supported the Nazis were Bismarckian welfare state socialists. They oppose free markets. They are unrecognizable to any conservative in America now. So it is only by a kind of intentional twisting of the meaning of the term conservative that it can be applied to even the people who supported or allied with the Nazis in the early 30s. <clears throat> All right, I've said a few things about, about fascism, enough, I think, to cast doubt on this kind of facile equation of fascism with the right. Um, even if Trump, he's, oh, he's accused every day of being an authoritarian, but wait a minute. I mean, Trump is flayed on every platform, <laughs> every minute of every day. A real authoritarian would never permit that. If Mussolini was ruling America right now, he would immediately send some black shirts to the New York Times to beat up all those reporters, take away all their equipment, shut down the whole operation, and replace them with black shirts writing what comes in the New York Times tomorrow. None of this is even happening, which suggests that the accusation of this kind of authoritarianism on the right is bogus. Now, if you want to find some black shirts in America, we kind of have to go to Berkeley. <laughs> <coughs> oh, yes. Oh, yeah. And by the way, I'm not just talking about <coughs> these sort of slack-jawed losers who are in, in black outfits are carrying their, you know, their little bike lock. <laughs> I mean, <clears throat> quite honestly, these imbeciles are, uh, are not even competent enough to be called fascists. Uh, they're not. They're not. No, not. They're basically guys who came out of mom's basement and are looking for a fight. Now, there is a fascism to be concerned about, but it's the fascism of the mayor of Berkeley, Jesse Aragon. He's the guy who calls off the cops. So the fascism of the institutions is much more dangerous than the fascism of the street. The fascism of a company like Google that can grab a guy who writes some memo criticizing their diversity policy, puts him on the street. Uh, the fascism of the studio bosses, where if you're a young screenwriter, they'll make sure you never work in that town again if you cross them ideologically. This is the fascism that we need to worry about. 
fascism allied to power, to power. Now I want to pivot for a little bit because of time and I want to talk about white supremacy, talk about racism. In my earlier work, I've tried to establish beyond a shadow of a doubt that the Democratic Party has been the party of slavery, of segregation, of Jim Crow, of the Ku Klux Klan, of racial terrorism, and of opposition to the civil rights movement of the 1960s. This is the actual history of the Democratic Party. There's been a big fight about all this, um, a fight that has essentially been something like uh, 300 to 1 um, over this issue, uh, and over many of the specific claims I've made in the past. In the movie Hillary's America, for example, I made the observation that in 1860, the year of the Civil War, the year before the Civil War, no Republican owned a slave. Not no Republican leader owned a slave, no Republican owned a slave. All the slaves in the whole country, four million of them, were owned by Democrats. You will not find this statement in any textbook, in any article, in any media account whatsoever, and yet there it is, a sort of scientific statement, and it's eminently refutable, by which I mean, all you have to do is give me a list of five Republicans who own slaves, and I would have to take it back. But to this date, one and a half year after my movie, not a single counterexample has ever been mentioned. Now, one guy, I must admit, an assiduous uh, PhD researcher, wrote me some months ago and goes, Dinesh, I kinda gotcha. Ulysses S. Grant inherited a slave, a solitary slave, on his wife's side. And I replied and said, uh, you know, pretty, pretty good attempt and, and almost a touche, but when that happened to Ulysses S. Grant, I do wish to point out that he was a Democrat. <laughs> Later, he, Ulysses S. Grant moved over into the Republican camp. <clears throat> now, I say this because all this material about the history of the Democratic Party is very important because the meaning of this business with the Confederate monuments, there's a real significance to what's going on. The significance is that the Democrats have for now <clears throat> well over 50 years, tried to shift the blame <clears throat> from themselves onto America or the South. America did it. Wait a minute. America didn't do anything. Some Americans did things, and other Americans stopped them. <coughs> so this effort to blame <coughs> America is a scam. This is why poor Kaepernick is such a, is such a dummy. <laughs> you know, America did this, America did that. America didn't practice slavery. Sla the whole pro-slavery ideology developed in the South and was defended by the Democratic Party North and South. And long after the Civil War, people say, well, this is a, a regional, no. The Northern Democrats were completely in it. Uh, Ira Katz Nelson, the historian from Columbia, makes a very telling observation in his recent book called Fear Itself. He points out that when FDR <clears throat> wanted to get the New Deal through, he had to meet with the Democratic racists, mainly Southerners. <clears throat> Sits them down, he goes, what will it take to get, me to get you to vote for the New Deal? The racists basically tell FDR, you have to agree to block all anti-lynching laws. FDR agrees. Think about this. The great sainted progressive of the 20th century agrees to block anti-lynching laws. That's condition number one. We're just warming up. Condition number two, all New Deal programs should be written in such a way to exclude blacks. Now you can't openly exclude blacks, but let's cut out, blacks are mainly working in domestic service, agricultural labor, let's leave those out of Social Security. FDR agrees again. Now here's the point. How do you block Republican proposals to stop lynching? And the answer is, the Northern Democrats always vote with the Southern Democrats. The Northern Democrats block lynching. They block the anti-lynching laws. 
And so this whole notion that this was a north-south issue is a fake. It was a straight debate over party lines in which northern and southern Democrats colluded to block anti-lynching laws and kick blacks out of Social Security and other New Deal programs. This is a fact. Now, <clears throat> forced to admit all this, the final refuge of the whimpering Democrat at this late stage of the discussion is to invoke the big switch and the Southern strategy. And I don't want to leave this discussion without saying a word about those things now. <clears throat> the big switch. The parties, the story goes, traded platforms. They switched. The Republicans sort of became Democrats. The Democrats sort of became Republicans. Now, on the face of it, you know, unless you have what I would call the sucker's turn of mind, when you hear something like this, your antenna should go up. It's kind of like if someone were to come to you and go, hey, guys, let me tell you about something really important that happened on a certain date in American history. The cops all became robbers, and the robbers all became cops. They switched. You'd be like, what? When did that happen? How did that happen? Right? I mean, on the face of it, it's stupid. If you examine it, it's dumb. In the 1930s, the Democratic Party was the party of the expanding welfare state, the New Deal, and then the Great Society. Is that now the platform of the Republican Party? Has there been a switch? No. And Democrats are still doing what they always did. Abraham Lincoln, in defining slavery, defined it as you work, I eat i.e. state slavery is theft of a man's labor. And Lincoln says, that's the heart of the Democratic Party. He goes, the Republican Party stands for the opposite. As Lincoln puts it, the hand that makes the corn has the right to put the corn in its own mouth. In other words, people get to keep their own stuff. And I ask you, 150 years later, is that not even now the central platform of the Republican Party, that we should, we should by and large keep the fruits of our own labor. And in admittedly modified form, is it not also the case 150 years later that if we had to find one phrase to describe the Democratic Party's operating platform now, you could do a lot worse than you work, I eat. That's what they stand for even now. There hasn't really been a switch at all. Now, <clears throat> in fairness, I should point out that there actually has been two political sh movements, two shifts that are very important. Blacks, who used to be Republicans, became Democrats. The South, which used to be Democratic, became Republican. So there actually has been a switch. But remember, the key point of the big switch is to argue that both these things happened on account of race. In other words, Blacks, seeing that the Democratic Party is friendly to civil rights, moved over. Republicans, seeing that the Democratic Party is friendly to civil rights, moved over in the opposite direction. The racists kind of became Republicans. It is this that I'm about to show is a complete fraud. First of all, when did blacks join the Democratic Party? When did blacks go from being 70% Republican to being 70% Democrat? Now, the beauty of all this stuff is that today, you don't have to believe me, you can look it up. The answer is, by 1936. 71% of African Americans in 1936 voted for FDR. And that number has now gone up by another 10 percentage points or so. But the reality is that the black switch occurred in the 30s. Now, in the 30s, the Democratic Party was, by common agreement, the party of segregation in the Ku Klux Klan. Blacks did not switch because of race. Blacks switched because of stuff. The New Deal offered benefits. Admittedly, it was the time of the Great Depression. These benefits meant a lot, however meager they were. That's why blacks switched. What about the other switch? Wh wh when did the South become Republican? Now, the answer is the South became Republican essentially on a trajectory starting in the 50s and really consummating in the Reagan era. And there's a big debate about what happened. Why did the South move into the Republican column? 
Now, the storyline from the left <coughs> is that Richard Nixon, Tricky Dick, came up with something really tricky. And that is, he decided to appeal to the racists of the Deep South. And he initiated something called the Southern Strategy. <clears throat> now, supposedly this Southern Strategy wooed the Dixiecrats, the racist wing of the Republican Party, pulling them into the Republican camp. Number one, that never happened. Only one Dixiecrat, Strom Thurmond, became a Republican. Of all the dozens of Dixiecrats, all of them stayed in the Democratic Party. That is a fact. <coughs> fact number two, Nixon never appealed to the Deep South. Nixon was not a dummy. The Republican base was in the North and in the West. Kevin Phillips, Nixon's chief advisor, told him, if you appeal to the Deep South, you'll lose the rest of the country. Appeal to the Upper South, appeal to the non-racist South, appeal to Southerners who are moved to cities, appeal to people in Raleigh, appeal to places where industry is coming, transforming the Old South, leave the racists in the Democratic Party, peel off the non-racists. That's what Nixon did. Proof, in 1968, George Wallace, the segregationist Democrat, won the Deep South. Nixon took the Upper South. So the theory that I'm laying out is corroborated by the actual results of the 68 election. And the reason the South finally tilted into the Republican camp, even the Deep South, is <clears throat> not racism. It's Reagan's appeal to anti-communism. It's Reagan's appeal to free markets. Reagan's appeal to patriotism, Christianity, pro-life, a whole set of issues on which Southerners are instinctively more conservative, and the Democratic Party has pivoted sharply on those issues to the left. Even Nixon's phrase, acid amnesty and abortion, which was kind of his insult on the Democratic Party. Think about it. Acid, this refers to hippies and drugs. Amnesty, the Vietnam War. Abortion, none of those issues even touch on race. So the whole idea that Nixon was, by the way, this is Nixon, the guy who started affirmative action. The first affirmative action program was in Philadelphia, started by Richard Nixon. This is supposed to be the great racist. All the people who say Nixon had a racist Southern strategy, none of them have found a single racist statement that Nixon actually made in public. I stress in public because Nixon was a bundle of phobias in private. If you listen to the private Watergate tapes, Nixon has all kinds of crazy stuff to say about the Irish, the Italians, the Jews, short people. He has all kinds of prejudice. He's a bundle of prejudices. But the public Nixon was a consummate Machiavellian, never said something without thinking about it. And how can you have a racist strategy in which no one can give you a single example of any racist thing that Nixon even said? It's stupid. It makes no sense. All right. So where does this all bring us? I think where it brings us is that the left <clears throat> has played a fascism card and it's played a race card. These are its two best cards. And the reason that they keep playing it is it, it works. And why does it work? Because our side is often uninformed. They don't know better. Poor Ken Melman, uh, chairman of the RNC, Republican National Committee, was going to black churches 10 years ago apologizing for the racist history of the Republican Party. Sorry, Mr. Melman, but there is no racist history of the Republican Party. You're a sucker for the big lie. Too many of us are. I was too. So the, I think the power of this stuff, of this work that I'm trying to do now in books, and I'm going to put it in a movie next summer, is it strips away the race card and the fascism card. It actually pins the racist and fascist tail right where they belong on the democratic donkey. And the power of this is that if you take away these two cards, the left has no cards left. And this it will actually bring American politics to where it really ought to be, which is a real debate about education and health care and tax. Notice that we're not having that debate right now, and we can't because the atmosphere is too poisoned. And part of what I'm here to say 
is that the very people who have poisoned the wells are now showing up pretending to be the water commissioner. The left, the actual perpetrators of all the horrors of American history, virtually every grand legal of the Ku Klux Klan is a Democrat. But they'll grab onto David Duke, the one guy that they can try to pin on the Republican Party. And again, information is power. So I'm very pleased to speak on a campus. I'm very pleased to give you this information. I hope it's helpful to you. I think my goal is to make you a very dangerous American in very dangerous times that we live in. Because if you are that, you will be one of those people who will make a big difference in helping to rescue and save this country. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Wow, well, I don't know about you, but I feel a lot better about myself being an American than I did a little bit ago. Um, so Dinesh is going to take some questions, I believe, from all of you. And what we're going to ask is that if you have a question, you go that way, go up behind, and then come around down these stairs over here. And then you'll wait in front of Karen, and then you'll come up. Um, I will hold the microphone and you will ask your question. Please only ask one question. Please make sure that it is a question, not a statement, uh, and try to keep it, keep it as brief as possible because we want everyone to get to uh, ask their questions. So um, with that, uh, we've got a couple of people headed over here for questions. Um, if you have a question, just, uh, like I said, go over there and come up around and, and we'll try to get it answered for you. I'm looking forward to this. I hope you are as well. By the way, if you're, if you're wondering why you, why you can't go this way, you know, and you have to go all that way around to ask the question, it's because in this audience, we don't turn left. <laughs> if we need to go left, we make three right turns. That's the ideological rationale for this. Anyway, let's get started. First off, as a Zoolander cosplayer, this made it very difficult for me. No, I'm uh, one thing you mentioned earlier were a lot of the uh, so-called useful idiots of the left, the black bloc, the kind of street movers, the shock troops of the left. How exactly do you propose we interact with these people moving forward, uh, understanding that if we do push back hard enough, we're just going to continue radicalizing them? How can we really like get them to realize some of their hypocrisy, get them to really get that introspection that they clearly lack? The question is what to do about these Antifa goons. Um, how do you actually tame them? Um, and uh, is it by resisting them or by sort of pointing out their hypocrisy? I think, unfortunately, when people cross the line into blockades, intimidation, and violence, the reason that they do it is because it works. Uh, and it doesn't just work against you know, uh, radicals that works against mainstream scholars. Charles Murray goes up to Middlebury College and they stage a mini riot and they basically roughneck the female professor who, was, who invited him to come speak. And Charles Murray is able to give his talk, but he gives his talk now in an empty room with students watching only in other. So the, the, the mission was successful. Uh, to me, uh, once you cross the line into, into using force, you have to be met by much greater force. And so if it were me, if I were Trump, and you had these riots at Berkeley, I would send in the National Guard. Why? For the same reason that Eisenhower sent in the National Guard when Governor Orville Faubus, a Democrat, by the way, mentor of Bill Clinton, was blocking black kids from entering the school. Uh, uh, civil rights and constitutional rights are not up for debate. The, it is the job of the government to enforce these enforce the law and, and protect our rights. That's why, by the way, we, we live under this constitutional system. So I would be kind of tough on those guys because I think that is actually the language that will help them to learn best. Part of the problem is that these people have been pampered at home. <clears throat> and so they have never learned responsibility or limits. Um, they've, uh, they, they have never had, you know, uh, they've never been whooped for what they did. They've just been given timeouts. Um, 
And so I think uh, the kind of timeout that some of them need now is a little bit of a timeout in prison. <laughs> timeout. Hi, Dinesh. Um, one of the best criticisms of conservatism um, actually comes from the right, and that it seems to be in the long arc of history ultimately a losing strategy. It seems that, you know, since the American Revolution and to some degree the French Revolution, slowly we've been moving leftward particularly in the West, the United States and the Western countries. So I guess my question is, you know, are we just holding the line and buying time? You know, when you look at like Reaganism and Thatcherism, there's, we can move conservative, but it's short lived. Um, so yeah, are we just buying time in an ultimately losing strategy? Or is there, you know, kind of a long term uh, conservatism that is stable, that won't erode? Um, that's a very good question. And to the degree that conservatism is defined operationally as a defense of the status quo or an effort to restore some kind of a lost past, those types of conservatism, I think, are in fact vulnerable to the um, trends that you describe. But there's a different kind of conservatism that is that says that what we are conserving is the principles of the American Revolution. In other words, we're conserving a revolutionary tradition. And we are actually, far from being opposed to change, we want massive change in the direction of restoring those principles which have been eroded. Now, the reason I think Trump is significant here is he's pointing to a fatal, two fatal weaknesses in the Republican Party. The first is the Republican Party ignores the big megaphones of our culture, academia, the media, and Hollywood, which are now essentially owned almost by the left. It's very difficult to fight when that's the case, because that's, that's the way many Americans get their information. So now Trump understands the importance of fighting in the cultural sphere and the political sphere. And that's why when he's, you know, he's pulling us out of the trade treaty, he's f working on Obamacare, he's got the tax plan, but he doesn't, he finds time to swat Meryl Streep <laughs> and take on Saturday Night Live and the NFL because he knows that this cultural territory is really important. The other thing about Trump is that he's, he's a fighter. <clears throat> Just contrast Trump and Romney, right? <laughs> it's basically, it's basically like, comparing Mike Tyson to an invertebrate, <laughs> right? Oh. Now, now Romney, Romney was caricatured, admittedly, four years ago as a rich guy. He's not that rich. But still, poor Romney was like impaled on the wall. You know, I'm not rich. <laughs> Trump has a lot more money than Romney, but you can never accuse Trump of being rich, because if you do, he tells you he's even richer than you think. <laughs> it doesn't work. You can try it. So Trump is, you know, Reagan was above the fray. Trump is totally in the fray. And so even though I'm, at times I have reservations about Trump, but I'm not one of these guys who's like, you know, Romney, let's take away Trump's Twitter. <laughs> and do what? Give it to you? What would you do with it? <laughs> so for these reasons, I think, I think that Trump has a good instinct about where we are in politics. And we'll see what comes of it. Okay, next question. <clears throat> okay, you're gonna hold it, okay. Uh, okay, Dinesh, um, got a question for you here that there's something that I just do not understand economically. Now here in the city of Seattle, it seems to be a very liberal wonderland. Um, in fact, sometimes I refer to it as the Democratic People's Republic of Seattle, but that's another story. We see a lot of liberalism spreading across the city, a lot of liberal policies. Good luck as a Republican to ever get elected to the city council. They're electing socialists now. But at the same time, people are still moving here. There is still growth in the city. I mean, what am I missing? You'd think you'd want to flee this place. Uh, I was wondering if you can shed some light on the economics there as to 
are we wrong with the conservative theory? I mean, does liberalism, a Seattle example of liberalism working? Uh, can you shed some light on that? The, <clears throat> there's a certain type of liberalism that can thrive parasitic on an energetic economy. I mean, our economy, the American economy, not all of it has been doing well, but certain sectors in communications and technology have done incredibly well. And it really does, and, and ironically, historically, as people became wealthier, they always became more Republican. This is a sort of iron law of history. When I was at AEI uh, 20 years ago, my colleague Irving Crystal used to say that Jews are the only people who earn like Episcopalians and vote like Puerto Ricans. <laughs> only Jews, no one else. As the Irish, the Italians became more prosperous, they became Republican. But American politics has now changed because of the social issues. So that a lot of affluent people pivot left. They're, it's not because they don't believe in free markets, it's that because they're doing well enough in the economic sector that liberalism becomes a vehicle for self-expression. It becomes a vehicle ultimately for yoga um, and for the man who suddenly realizes he was always a woman. Uh, and these kinds of unbelievable personal discoveries um, are, um, are encouraged by liberalism. Uh, and in fact, they take certain types of money to execute. Um, so I, I think that in, in pockets like Seattle, Raleigh, Durham, Silicon Valley, you can have prosperous economies that are magnets for people to come. They're coming because of the opportunity. Believe me, uh, you know, Asian Indians aren't flocking to Silicon Valley because they've discovered that they're women. Uh, they, they, they're coming there to make apps and things. Uh, but they'll move into these, to these places and they will, they will swim in the tide uh, because, you know, and some of it is opportunism. You have to surf on the wave. If you're in Seattle, this is how you have to be. So even if you're conservative, you sort of censor that. Kind of like being on a campus. It forces you ultimately to, to play a theatrical game. It's a little unfortunate. It's a, it's a mark of the intolerance of this moment in America. I hope that goes away. Oh, sorry. Hi, uh, Mr. D'Souza. I was wondering, why don't you just call leftists communists and you call them fascists? Oh, because, um, because leftist policy today resembles fascism far more than communism. Let's consider the example of Obamacare. Now, traditional communism, if, if it were Lenin or if it were Stalin, they would take over the healthcare industry. Socialists throughout the world, their main strategy is nationalization. That's what happened in India. They nationalized the airline, they nationalized the banks. Now notice in Obamacare that we don't have that. We have private in hospitals, we have private insurance companies, but the government directs them. The government sets the prices, the government decides who's eligible. In short, Obamacare can be described as state-run capitalism. Now that is the economic definition of fascism. Look it up. Fascism means state-run capitalism. And under Obama, the state control has expanded over not just healthcare, not just every hospital, every hospice, every doctor, but over banks, investment companies, the energy sector. Hillary and Bernie wanted to increase federal control over the higher education sector. So, to, to anyone with a historical resonance, this is actually fascist economics, much more so than traditional socialism. Okay? okay. Next question. <clears throat> Hi. Um, I was wondering what you would say the main tenets of modern conservatism are in your idea. That's a good question. What are the tenets of modern American conservatism? I would say that basically, <clears throat> Now, uh, in the Reagan era, conservatism stood for three things. Anti-communism in foreign policy, free markets in economic policy, uh, and you might say a kind of emphasis on the traditional family in social policy. That's still not very far from what modern American conservatism is. 
I would say in the, in the foreign policy domain, it's just a recognition that we live in a dangerous world. It's not a prescription for using force always or everywhere. Uh, the use of force is always prudential. And remember under Reagan, even when the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan, Reagan didn't send troops. He just sent, Reagan's view was that people should fight for their own freedom. They fight, we help. That's where I would go in foreign policy. In domestic policy, it's an emphasis on free markets. The hand that makes the corn keeps the corn. Uh, <clears throat> and in social policy, it's just a recognition that we not only want the free society, we also want the decent society. And so not through government regulation, but through an emphasis on the private sphere, cultivating the institutions that foster civic decency and virtue among the citizens, that is a map of modern American conservatism, in my opinion. Hello, Mr. D'Souza. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for coming. I really appreciated you coming today. Um, so my question relates to a lot of the work that you have been doing through, throughout the past many years, which is focusing on the history of the different parties and trying to um, create this picture that the Democratic Party is not what they say they are. Um, but then I pose the question, why do so many black Americans today not see the Republican Party as their party in such huge numbers? Why are we not the champions of Title IX? Why, when allegations come out about um, pedophilia or a sexual assault come out, why do Alabama Republicans vote, say, in polling numbers that they are now more likely to vote for Roy Moore? Why is this happening to the Republican Party if we are supposed to be the moral party? Um, I would just like to pose the question, like, is it really just ignorance that all of these people do not feel safe with the Republican Party? No. Um, well, the, the Roy Moore business in Alabama is a little different. Um, the Republican Party, um, not its establishment wing, because its establishment wing and I was part of this. I mean, you live in DC, your Bible, your daily news Bible is the Washington Post. So if the Washington Post says, we found four women to accuse Roy Moore, the typical Republican will go, there goes Roy Moore's career. You know, these guys are like wildebeests, you know, and they, are, they don't want to be the one that's shot or eaten. Uh, so at the slightest sign, they run. Um, they want the other wildebeest to be prey. Um, this is the sort of McConnell sensibility going on here. But there's a totally different sensibility, and it's not just in Alabama, because I, I feel it myself. And that is, in a world of limited information, you have to decide who to trust. And you have to decide um, how to ascertain what's true when you weren't there. So take the Roy Moore case. Yes, if Roy Moore did those things, he should absolutely be expelled from the Republican Party and not permitted to sit as a senator. But did he do them? Did he do them? Um, you know, I've seen Ben Shapiro tweeting out, well, gee, you know, did, did the Washington Post write that little memo in the little girl's yearbook? But now when you look at that, and you, if you, I don't know if you've been following this, it is not clear that Roy Moore wrote that. There are all kinds of indications that that is a forgery. And when Wolf Blitzer just asked Gloria Allred, will you certify that Roy Moore wrote that in the yearbook? She's saying, I won't. I'm not saying he did. I'm not saying he didn't. In other words, it's the timing of this accusation that raises, makes intelligent people think something fishy is going on. 40 years passes, the guy is now running for Senate, 30 days before the election, 10 accusations. Yeah. All these women were dead silent for the full 40 years, but now they come out in such a manner that none of their statements can be verified. All that can be verified is what they told each other. But there's no independent verification that he did any of this. So if he did it, those women have been grievously wronged. But if he didn't, he is being grievously wronged. So which of those two possibilities is happening? I don't know. Uh, let me just say this. <clears throat> let me take your other question about blacks in the Republican Party. 
The Republican Party, again, because it is so stung by the race card, because it believes all the lies about itself, it is scared to go into the black community. The only guy who has the courage to do it, in my opinion right now, is Trump. Trump can do it. And I hope he does do it. Because it's only when Republicans go into black communities and, and speak, I mean, if, if I gave this talk at Howard University to an to 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 all black audience, the same talk I've given tonight, I assure you it would shake up the audience. A lot of those people, when, when, I, when I made the movie Hillary's America, I hired black actors um, and put them in the movie. They knew nothing about the movie. They auditioned for roles, they were in the movie. To a man, at the end of the movie, all of them were like, we're out of the Democratic Party. We're gone. If what you say is true, Dinesh, we're no longer Democrats. But see, they've never heard it. It's never been said. And, and even Republicans will push back when you say it, because it, the Republican strategy is if anybody brings up race, the Republican says things like, why don't we talk about the bread and butter issues that are really important to America? <laughs> In other words, we're too scared to address this topic. We plead guilty, basically. Let's go talk about something else. This is the most disastrous strategy ever devised by man and it will sink the Republican Party if we keep at it. This is why we can't, we can't hinge our fate to people like McCain and Romney. It's literally, they are basically the, the, the Titanic of the Republican Party. Uh, we gotta go elsewhere, we gotta go elsewhere. Thank you for coming, Mr. D'Souza. So as a young conservative living in a really liberal state, how do I brand the conservative message in a way where I won't be labeled as a fascist or a white supremacist? The best way to do that is to Im that the moment that the charge is raised, to immediately flip it. Flip it and put it right back on the accuser. Um, think of it this way, you know? when. When the Republican Party is accused of racism today, and racism has associated with it all this moral horror, it's, it's a terrible thing to dehumanize people in this way, not just to look at them as inferior, but to steal their property, uh, to, de to, to, to string them up on a tree, right? Now, here's my point. No Republican has done any of this. All of this has been done by Democrats. This is their actual history. Every lynching in the United States Every lynching in the United States has been with the sanction of the Democratic Party or been carried out by actual Democrats. Think about that, think about the mean, if that statement is true, the significance of that. So what I'm getting at is we have nothing to apologize for. It's true, in a, in a liberal environment, somebody will, and, and they do it to me all the time, they go, Dinesh, you know what you're talking about. Dinesh, the party switch side. Dinesh this, Dinesh that. But, but all you have to do is give me a little bit of time and, and, and each of these tentacles that comes out, I chop it off. The next one comes out again, I chop that one off. <laughs> it takes a little bit of work. But once you've done the work, you see the, you see the fruit of it. And the fruit of it ultimately is that you've basically got an incredibly tongue-tied Democrat. Um, uh, and, 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 and that's where you wanna be. So, so take advantage of the fact that you're in hostile territory and use the power of information and surprise you know, think of this this way. If you're debating a guy, you know everything that he's gonna say. He has no idea what you're gonna say. That's an advantage that you have. Use it. Howdy. Um, you mentioned that Roosevelt was a huge fan of fascists and uh, Mussolini. And at the same time, around that time period, the Democrats had huge majorities in the House and the Senate, and he used that to pack the courts and so forth, and it seems like a pretty grim situation, and yet I'm curious what ultimately prevented us from following in the footsteps of Italy, joining the Axis, and going down that, you know, repealing the Constitution, you know, and remaking America completely in the image of real fascism. The, uh, well, I think the answer to that is two, twofold. Uh, one was the, the global imperial ambitions of the Nazis. So if you think, for example, of the Hitler-Stalin pact, 
Hitler and Stalin were uh, allied, not just ideologically, they were allied as nations. But Hitler double-crossed Stalin and invaded Russia. Now, that was not because he was a socialist or he was not a socialist. Basically, Hitler's view was that the Germans didn't have enough living space. And so his point is that if we take Poland, we take um, uh, the uh, Central European countries, uh, we, will, we will displace those people, settle this land with German families. This was Hitler's imperial ambition. There's no question that ideology aside, that this would threaten France, obviously Hitler invaded France, threaten Britain, and threaten America, America and American power in the world. So there is every good foreign policy reason for America to have turned against Hitler. FDR was never an admirer of Hitler, I should say. I want to be very clear. FDR did admire Mussolini. And in fact, FDR was hoping that Mussolini would intervene to moderate Hitler's imperial ambitions, a project that, that if, if Mussolini even tried it, did not work. So there were, there, were, there were reasons of contest of power for why these countries went to war that have nothing to do with ideology. Okay? <clears throat> this will be our last question. Uh, so what is, uh, what do you think the best way uh, is to talk about politics uh, with somebody that you disagree with without uh, increasing uh, to the process of political polarization? Okay, the question is, uh, how do you talk to someone today about politics without increasing polarization? Well, the first thing I would do is, I, I think there is a way to do it. But I would remove the without increasing polarization clause because the moment you start putting binders on yourself uh, and saying, I don't want this, I don't want that, it's going to weaken your ability to make progress. Let me put it this way. If I say to you, everything that you just told me is completely false, and you then feel like punching me, I will have increased polarization, right? That doesn't really worry me. I'm not concerned about increasing or decreasing polarization. That's not our problem. Our problem isn't that we have too much polarization or too little polarization. Our problem is that we have too little truth. We have too little knowledge of real history. Uh, we have too little... <laughs> so, sometimes you have to increase polarization to restore civility. A really good example I gave earlier with Antifa. If, by and large, if you engage in felony rioting, the penalty on the books is between five and 10 years in prison. Notice nobody gets this penalty. Why? The people on the left basically think that rioting is heroic. And that if they riot, they should basically be made to spend the night in jail, after which they can come out as a martyr the next day and go on MSNBC, or go tell their professor about it so he can congratulate them from being one of the most progressive forces in the universe. Now, if 10 of those guys got a five-year sentence, all this nonsense would come to a grinding halt. So well, again, I'm not talking about using fascist violence. I'm talking about enforcing the existing law in a uniform way on the left and the right. Someone's got to insist upon that. And, and if that causes polarization, so be it. But the uniform application of the law should not be a controversial result. Now, as a practical matter in a liberal campus, I would recommend the Socratic technique, which focuses really on the penetrating question. So, so for example, the two parties switch sides. You then say, oh really, how many Dixiecrats, how many racist Democrats became Republicans? They go, well, all of them, a lot of them, I don't know, a lot of them. Well, you say, well, God grant you Strom Thurmond was a racist Dixiecrat. He didn't become a Republican. Can you name a single second example? They won't be able to because there aren't any. But you need to know that in order to be able to formulate the Socratic question that is so crushing if you think about it. Someone is claiming that an entire generation of racist Democrats became Republican and they can't name two. What does that tell you? So in my opinion, you know, people are entitled to their own opinions, but they're not entitled to their own facts. 
and using, deploying, people talk about fake news. Today, today we've been talking about fake history, fake scholarship. If you can, and you're on a campus, become conversant with this kind of stuff, it makes you a very potent force. Um, and people will actually have to realize that they want to talk to you, they need to be informed. And the other beauty about living today is technology. If somebody makes a claim about the Dixie Crats, I don't have to send you to the library. Pull out your phone. Let's look it up. Well, let's look it up together. <laughs> and let's see who's lying, me or all the other guys. That's the beauty of today, is that we're living at a time where things can be checked out. Um, the statements I make are being broadcast, so they're in the public domain. They're very easily checkable. And so this, to me, is, 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 is a hopeful sign even against the wind of all the bad things happening, that at the end of the day, we can be pretty confident that the truth will prevail. Thank you all very much. It's really been a pleasure. Thanks so much. Thank you.